Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, Introducing the Strong Interest Inventory 244 Assessment. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a marketing manager at the Myers-Briggs Company. So before we get started, just going to take care of a few things at the top. Today's webinar will run for about an hour, um, hopefully with some question and answer time at the end. So please feel free to submit any questions in the questions box throughout the webinar, and we will be sure to get to them at the end or follow up via email with an answer afterwards. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out an email with a link to the slides and the recording, as well as a couple other key resources in the next few days. So now I am happy to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Mike Morris, and hand it over to you, Mike. All right, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. Uh, my name is Mike Morris. I'm the Director of Vocational Interest Research and Data Science at the Myers-Briggs Company. And I led the effort to develop the Strong Interest Inventory 244 assessment that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's see if I can advance. There we go. So our agenda in brief today is a little bit of background information on what vocational interests are, uh, what they're used for, and some of the results from the empirical literature um, about what interests are related to and some important outcomes that interests are related to. But we'll spend the bulk of our time today walking through some information on the Strong 244 assessment and the career satisfaction report, which is the, the feedback report that we have available uh, for sale today. Um, if we have time at the end, as Caitlin indicated, we'll uh, go through some, some questions and answers, but let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about why interests are important. Just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we thought it'd be good to, to go through a brief definition of vocational interests or work-related interests. You can see a more formal academic definition at the top, a pattern of likes, dislikes, and indifferences regarding career-relevant activities and occupations. Um, if you want a little more everyday language kind of definition, um, I like to refer to something that a lot of us were asked when we were kids. What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And really what we're trying to get at is um, an umbrella idea that looks at the kinds of activities and school subjects and occupations that people are drawn to, that people want to spend more time with, that they want to learn more about. Those are vocational interests or work-related interests, and that's what the strong assessment measures. So how can measuring interests help people? Well, like many assessments, like personality assessments or other kinds of assessments, measuring people's vocational interests can help learn about themselves. It's uh, often interesting to people all by itself just to figure out, well, are my interests in this area higher or lower than the general population? What does this pattern of interest say about me? So that all by itself is one reason to measure voc vocational interests. But another major um, reason to measure vocational interests is that you can broaden the number of career paths that people are aware of. You know, there's millions of jobs out there, especially for people that are younger and just entering the labor force. They may not, may not be aware of all the various options that they have to pursue. Taking an assessment like the Strong can help make people aware of different paths that are consistent with their interests. And if, you're, if you know yourself a little bit better, if you're a little bit better informed about the broad array of career options that are out there, you can help people make better career decisions. And that, that's really what this is all about, is to try to help people make better career decisions by finding subject areas, courses of study, occupations, work environments, companies that are congruent with their interests. So this idea of congruence is really important. You know, you want people to be able to find a good degree of fit with their job, with their course of study, with an organization. You can define congruence or fit in various ways, but this general idea that you're trying to help people find a good fit for their career 
is really uh, the driver behind why people find vocational interest measurement so useful. In terms of how the STRONG is used, um, you know, career exploration is probably the single biggest area where people use the STRONG. Oftentimes with young people, college, high school, early career, but not just younger people that are entering the world of work. Uh, we also use the STRONG in career transition situations where people have been laid off or downsized or are unhappy with their current career path and are looking for a new direction. The STRONG can be illuminating in terms of helping people find different options that they may want to pursue. And after people are done working, people sometimes use the STRONG to help with the retirement transition. Again, to try to find areas, activities, work, could be volunteer or paid work, um, where you can find a good fit, uh, where you can find areas that are a good fit for your particular interest pattern. But this idea of career exploration is really the major one in terms of uh, helping people explore and find areas that uh, are going to be congruent with their interests. Originally, I had a few slides uh, detailing this, but um, uh, for, for the sake of time, I thought I would just mention briefly some findings from the empirical literature around the importance of congruence and some of the benefits um, that accompany giving people uh, the strong assessment and some of the effects that you can expect out of it. Uh, point one is that giving people the strong assessment and having them work through an interpretation with a certified practitioner has been shown in a couple of different studies in true experiments with random assignment to conditions and measurement of outcome variables. So giving people the strong in an interpretation session has been shown to increase what's called career decision-making self-efficacy. So this is a kind of subjective impression that you can make good decisions for your own career. And we know from these studies that this, this sense that you can make good career decisions will increase if you've taken the strong assessment and go through a feedback session to review your results. So that's one nice benefit that you get out of the strong is that you can increase people's sense that they can make these good career decisions. But perhaps more important than that is that when people are in, a, in an environment where their interests are congruent with that environment, you tend to get a lot of really nice, beneficial, positive outcomes. So we know, for instance, that interests tend to predict the kinds of um, courses of study that people pursue in school. We know that interests tend to predict the kinds of occupations that people end up in, whether that's today or eight years from now or 12 years from now. But we also know that um, when people have high levels of congruence, they tend to be more satisfied with their jobs, they tend to be less likely to quit their jobs. They tend to perform better in those jobs. We know that people tend to do better in school when their interests are congruent with their subject area. We know that people tend to be more satisfied with their courses of study when their interest levels are more congruent than when they're less congruent. And what's great about these outcomes is that not only are they good for the individual, right? Who doesn't want to be satisfied? Who doesn't want to perform well? But these are also great outcomes for the educational institution, for the organizations that are employing these individuals, right? They want their employees to be satisfied. They want their employees to perform well. They don't want their employees to quit. So when you're helping people find areas where they can match their interests with their environments, there are widespread benefits, not just to the individual, but to the broader society as well. So a really nice set of outcomes uh, when you can help people find an environment that fits their interests. <clears throat> so that's why people use the STRONG assessment and some of the benefits that you can get from it. Let's go ahead and dive right into the STRONG 244 assessment and review some of the nice features that we've been able to implement with this latest revision. First, a brief history lesson. Um, we are coming up on 100 years of having the Strong product line. Uh, it made its debut in 1927, and since that time, it has been revised and updated and improved a number of times. 
Uh, you can see that we added a women's forum in 1933. Um, and from those humble beginnings with just a few occupation scales, we've added various sections of scales. And as you will see, there are now hundreds of different scores that you can get out of the strong assessment. The current form of the strong that we sometimes call the strong 291 for the 291 questions on it. This last full form of the strong was released in 2004. Occupation scales on it were updated in 2012. So this is the first revision we've had in a number of years on the full length strong and we're really excited to talk to you about it today. So here are some of the key new features that you will get out of the Strong 244 assessment. First, it is 100% gender neutral. That means there is no use of gender at all in any of the scoring, any of the interpretive labels, anywhere in any of the report content or any of the technical content other than the explanation or the, the display of gender differences and, and some of the validity analyses, there's no use of gender in scoring or interpretation of the results at all. So what that means is that when we present respondents with a demographic survey prior to taking the assessment, they can respond to the gender item as male or female, they can enter a different gender identity in a text box, or they can skip the question entirely. No matter what they enter, their response will not be used in any scoring or interpretation of their results. So we have completely removed that requirement from the Strong 244 assessment. Next, we have a lot of new occupation scores. The current Strong has 130 occupations. The Strong 244 assessment we've increased that number to 243 occupations. So over 100 new occupations on the Strong 244 assessment. And we have two scores now for every, uh, for every occupation. We have a similarity score that is directly analogous to the previous Strong's occupation scales. This indicates the uh, similarity of the respondent's interests to people who are in each of those occupations. We also have a new score for every occupation called a satisfaction score. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we walk through the report a little bit later in this talk. <clears throat> but it essentially represents the probability that this individual, this individual respondent will either be satisfied or very satisfied in that occupation. So two scores that accompany each of those 243 occupations. We have a new section of academic major scores. So this is the first time in the Strong's history that we've had uh, quantitative scores that we can present uh, around academic majors rather than conceptual mappings through say basic interest scales. But these academic major scores we have available for 33 broad um, academic majors for college. And like the occupation scores, we have both a similarity score for each major and a satisfaction score for each major. So I think that will be something that's really nice for a lot of practitioners because we know one of the major uses of the strong is to help students that are in college or high school figure out what course of study is a good fit for them. We've tried to make uh, updates and changes and improvements across um, all sets of scales, but just a couple more noteworthy um, uh, features here to mention. We have two new basic interest scales on the Strong 244. This brings the total up to 32 basic interest scales. Those new ones are hospitality and tourism, which falls under the social theme, and conservation and environmentalism, which falls under the investigative theme. We've improved the consistency index to detect uh, inconsistent or random uh, responding, inattentive responding. And we've done all of this while shortening the assessment by over 40 items. One thing to note, and I will uh, mention this uh, repeatedly throughout the talk, is that this new assessment is not replacing the current strong assessment. 
The current strong assessment will continue to exist for some time. The strong 244 assessment and the career satisfaction report are newly available options for practitioners. So both will continue to exist. In terms of a side-by-side -side comparison about the, the current strong assessment, the 291 and the strong 244 assessment, you can see the differences in terms of number of items, 291 versus 244. Both assessments have six general occupation themes. These are the Holland themes or the RIASEC or RIASEC measures, the kind of common language, common currency of a lot of vocational interest measurements. You can see the two new basic interest scales in the strong 244, 30 versus 32, one additional personal style scale. And the big differences uh, would be the dramatic increase in occupation scales and the new academic major scales that we have on the strong 244 assessment. Other perhaps points of interest, um, we've built the largest general reference sample that we've ever had. Uh, the new general reference sample is 100,000 people. These are, uh, this sample is intended to represent the United States workforce and be representative in a number of different ways. We have also built this entire scoring infrastructure and report infrastructure in a way that makes it far easier for us to make updates in the future. And while I don't have dates and cannot confirm any particular um, plan around updating, we do hope to update the occupations and majors regularly in the coming years so that the assessment and its results stay fresh. Um, so what that means is that we will both update the number of occupations and majors, ideally adding to the list, and refreshing the models that are behind them for satisfaction and similarity so that they always have the latest and most current data that we can get. So we do hope to um, do a great job going forward about keeping the uh, results fresh and as current as possible. Uh, finally, I want to mention here the, um, the supplement, the strong supplement. And you can see the, uh, the link here on screen. Caitlin is going to be sending this out uh, through the magic of GoToMeeting so that you can click on this link yourself. Uh, the strong supplement is akin to, but not identical to, the technical manual. So rather than making a printed book of technical information around the Strong 244 assessment, we decided to take a new approach uh, to make the supplement of psychometric information online and completely free. So you can go to this link right now and um, read all about the technical properties of the assessment. I wanted to actually show this to you on screen so that you can um, get an idea of what's here. On the left-hand side, you can see various chapters that we have for different sections of scales. You can go ahead and click on these links and be taken directly to these chapters. Um, so this is just a really nice way that you can go ahead and um, find exactly the information that you want to look for. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is that we have a search bar. So if you want to just find a particular piece of information like test retest reliability, you can just search for that. It will get highlighted in the text and you can click on these links uh, so that you can be taken directly to the relevant information in the particular chapters where that information is contained. So that's a really nice feature is that you not only have to, you know, don't have to carry around a book with you, um, but you can access this from your phone or your desktop and um, find exactly the information you're looking for. I'll also just point out that this is really easy for me to update. I am the author of this entire set of information. You can see a date here. The last time I updated this was last week. This is intended to be a living, breathing, reference source. So if you are looking through this and you wish there was some piece of information that was in there and it's not there, contact me. It's possible that I will be able to add that information. Um, so I'm hoping that this becomes a more and more useful resource over time. 
And of course, like I talked about, we plan to update things uh, in coming months and years, occupations, majors. This is where you will find all the latest information. I can regenerate all these pages if we happen to make any changes to scoring um, or any other um, kinds of behind the scenes changes. I can update everything uh, in a matter of hours. And so this, I think, is going to be a really nice resource for practitioners going forward. All right. Here are some things to know and keep in mind uh, with this kind of onslaught of information I'm giving you here. Uh, again, a reminder that the current strong assessment and its reports will remain available. So um, rest assured, you do not have to transition out of this immediately. Uh, second, for, for practitioners who are currently certified, the vast majority of what you know about the current strong assessment is going to carry over quite easily to the strong 244 assessment. So the general occupation themes, basic interest scales, most of the personal style scales are interpreted very similarly or exactly the same. In addition, the occupation and major similarity scores are built and normed in exactly the same way or very similar way as the previous occupation scales. So if you're aware of how to use the previous occupation scales, you're in a very good position to understand the occupation and major similarity scores. In terms of what's most different, uh, the satisfaction scores are pretty clearly uh, a, a major change, uh, a new set of scores um, that's available with the 244 and the career satisfaction report. So I would recommend that practitioners who are interested in using the 244 spend a bit of time learning about satisfaction scores and pondering how they might use them best. In addition, of course, we have the new section of academic major scores. So with the, those direct quantitative scores that we now have available, practitioners are probably going to want to spend some time thinking about how they can best make use of those. Uh, with, uh, with people that are looking at entering an academic major uh, environment. All right. So with that, that's the assessment. Let's talk a bit about the career satisfaction report itself. So the career satisfaction report is intended to be the successor, kind of a next generation version of the current strong profile. <clears throat> It's intended to have a very similar look and feel. It's supposed to make a transition easy for people that are used to using the current strong profile. And really it has a broad um, intent, which is to help people explore academic and career pathways to help them find their ideal careers. It includes all the sections of scales that we've reviewed in terms of general occupation themes, basic interest scales, personal style scales, academic and ma uh, major and and occupation results, and a response summary that's uh, for practitioners to look at the response patterns um, for their clients. The career satisfaction report can only be generated from the Strong 244 assessment. You cannot generate this report from the Strong 291. It has to be from the Strong 244 assessment. And for those who are currently certified in the Strong, you are automatically allowed to purchase the, the career satisfaction report and begin to use the uh, Strong 244 assessment. You do not need to be recertified. Uh, that, of course, is, <clears throat> is driven by the fact that the vast majority of what you know about the Strong already will carry over to the 244 assessment. In terms of some basic information about the report, you can see the pricing. The pricing for the career satisfaction report is $17.95. There are, there are volume discounts available, just like there are with other reports that we sell from the company. <clears throat> this report is currently available on Elevate, uh, and the process for purchasing and using the career satisfaction report is exactly the same as it is for the other reports that we have on Elevate. So you can purchase it through Elevate, you can set up your projects and add it uh, to projects just like you would um, any other assessment or report. The system knows that if you're using the career satisfaction report that the respondents need to complete the Strong 244 assessment. So that will be handled for you as you work through the purchase 
process and um, project setup process. A reminder, of course, that the 244 is a gender neutral. The career satisfaction report presents results in a gender neutral way, whereas the strong profile makes use of gender responses. And of course, the report content, which um, goes through the differences and results that you can get from the strong assessment and the strong 244 assessment. More information is available on the career satisfaction report. Okay, so I thought it'd be helpful to spend a few minutes just walking through the report in detail. This will give you uh, great information about what's here in the report and gives me a chance to explain a little bit more about how some of these uh, changes were implemented for the assessment and the presentation of results. So you can see the cover page on screen. Um, like I said, this was intended to be a successor report to the strong profile, so very similar look and feel. Um, so as you can see, the, the cover page looks very similar. Uh, we will have the ability, if it's not released already, I think it will be in coming weeks, to have the cover customization with um, an organization and interpreted by uh, fields that we have for the current strong profile. Page two, this is the same for all respondents, and again, looks similar to what we see on the strong profile, but this gives the, uh, the client some basic information about how they can benefit by looking at their results and how their results are organized. We then move to the general occupation theme section. Again, this should look very familiar to those of you who are used to using the strong profile. But there are a couple of changes that I want to highlight that may not be obvious as you look at this set of results. One is the ordering of the, the six general occupation themes. Um, on the strong career satisfaction report, you will always see the themes in descending order by standard score. Okay, So you will never run into a situation like you have on the strong profile where some respondents may have a lower standard score appear above in order of higher standard scores. This is because we have taken away the use of gender in the application of these interpretive labels. So those that, that use of gender could sometimes result in lower standard scores being ranked higher than higher standard scores. And of course, that's something that you have to explain and that sometimes clients would question. But that is just not going to happen anymore. Uh, standard scores will be listed in order here. They may be tied, but they will be uh, in, in numeric order here, descending order. A second change ha has to do with what we call flat profiles. Flat profiles occur when a respondent has little or very little interest in all six general occupation themes. In the current strong profile, if somebody has that pattern, they would have a blank here under your theme code. They would get no GOT theme code. We've made the decision to go ahead and assign that respondent's highest interest score a single letter theme code. So now when you are working with clients that have a flat profile, you'll notice that everybody gets a theme code. We think that that's a little bit more palatable for clients that have very little or little interest across a variety of areas, they have at least some code to work with. It's something you can start a conversation with, but that is a change you will notice that they're no longer possible to get a blank theme code here in this GOT section. All right. Next, we have the basic interest scales page. Again, this should look very similar to the current strong profile. We do have the two new basic interest scales in this section. We have the top six interest areas. We have the bottom three uh, interest areas. But otherwise, this page is very, very similar and should be simple for people to work with. Personal style scale section, again, looks very similar. I do want to talk a little bit, though, about the differences in the scales. Uh, the previous strong profile had five personal style scales. Uh, the strong 244 career satisfaction report has six personal style scales. Learning environment through team orientation are very similar to the previous strong approach. 
The difference though, is that we took what used to be the work style scale, and we split that into two different personal style scales. The previous work style scales was set up such that uh, work, preference for working with people was on one side, people, uh, and a preference working with things, ideas, or data was on the other side. So people on one side, things, ideas, data on the other side. And what we've done here is we split apart that scale into two. So we now have people, things on one dimension, and ideas, data on another dimension. This corresponds to what is known as the Prediger model in the vocational interest literature. So this is, you could think of this as an alternative representation of, um, of interests akin to the Holland model, the Riasek model. Uh, but a lot of people in the literature are familiar with this and you'll see results that use these kind of measures in the literature. And so we thought to be consistent with that and to give people an opportunity to work with that, we would split apart that work style scale into people, things, and data ideas. <clears throat> so that's where that new personal style scale comes from, is from splitting apart the previous work style scale. Next, we have the occupation results. And this is where you start to see some of the, the bigger differences between the current strong profile and the new career satisfaction report. You'll notice that the, the look and feel of it is a lot different. We do not break the results of the occupations down by the uh, RIASEC themes that are associated with each of the um, occupations. We simply have a very long table uh, with the, uh, the multiple scores that we have for each occupation. So I'm gonna highlight um, what we've got in the table and kind of talk through that a bit. But a lot of what I'm saying, um, I'm going to say is covered in this block of text at the top of this uh, page six here. But let me go ahead and focus on the table. First thing you may notice if you're used to the current strong profile is that instead of a top 10 on the first page of occupation results, we have a top 20. What we heard from customers over the years is that a lot of clients would focus on their top 10 and ignore all of the rest of the results. And uh, you know, the strong is intended to, to open up possibilities and to get people to consider a broad variety of occupations, not to just focus on those top few scores. So we wanted to lengthen the number of occupations that we presented right away. And so we've gone to a list of 20. You can see those top 20 here. If you are working with an electronic PDF, like I am here, you can click on this link to show all. And what that will do is it'll take you to a very long table covering multiple pages at the end of the PDF that will list all 243 of your occupations. But for now, in this flow of the, the main content of the report, let's look at these top 20 and talk you through some of the information that's presented here. The first listed occupation for this respondent is graphic designers. And notice these are underlined links. So if you are working with an electronic PDF, you can click on these links. And I don't know if you can see the, the small text there, but this will take you directly to the Department of Labor's ONET website and a web page that has a lot of detailed information about this particular title of graphic designers. So ONET will have information around tasks and work activities and interests and a whole variety of information so that people who are not familiar with what a graphic designer does can learn about what a graphic designer does. And every single occupation that we list on the career satisfaction report has a corresponding link to ONET. We organize our occupation data and build our models based on ONET's titles. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between our titles and what is in the ONET system in terms of the titles we use and how we link to them. So if you want more information on any of these occupations, it's very easy to use this report and go get more information easily. In the next column, we have a GOT theme code, a Holland theme code. So for graphic designers, you can see here that it is associated with artistic interests. 
our theme codes on the strong and on the career satisfaction report are based on data from people that work in each of these jobs. So our theme code of artistic for graphic designers was calculated based on a sample of graphic designers that completed the strong assessment. So you may notice a difference if you click through on graphic designers and go to the ONET page, they have a theme code there as well. But ONET's theme codes are uh, prepared by a group of organizational psychologists who made ratings about graphic designers' interests, whereas ours are based on actual data collected uh, by graphic designers and all these other titles who completed the strong assessment. So ours is based on incumbent data, ONETS is based on expert ratings. Oftentimes these codes are similar or the same, but sometimes they're different and that is the reason why. But this gives you kind of a summary idea of the interest patterns that are associated with each of these titles. Next, we have a satisfaction score. And this is, again, a new set of scores that are available on the Strong 244 on the Career Satisfaction Report. What a satisfaction score indicates is the probability that this respondent, based on their interests, will be either satisfied or very satisfied in each occupation. So our model suggests that this respondent, this sample report respondent, would have a 51% probability of being either satisfied or very satisfied as a graphic designer. These are models that are based on data that we have from graphic designers and the interest dimensions that are most predictive of satisfaction amongst graphic designers. You can read more about satisfaction scores and about how the models are built and so on at the free online technical supplement that we referenced earlier in this talk. So those are satisfaction scores. Similarity scores are directly analogous to occupation scales from the previous strong. So our guidance that we teach practitioners in our certification course is that scores of 40 and above indicate similarity, similarity of this respondent's interests to people who are in each of these occupations. And as you can see in this sample report, we've got a number of different occupations where uh, this respondent will be judged to be similar. So similarity scores, probably a lot of you are already familiar with how to interpret. Finally, we thought because we're providing two sets of scores for each occupation, it was probably good to figure out a way to combine those scores into a general set of, of occupations to recommend. And that's where we indicate um, those occupations in this top column. So what we've done is we've assigned somewhere between zero and three stars to occupations based on this respondent's highest similarity and satisfaction scores. We take both into account in order to make these zero to three top star recommendations. Everybody will get top recommendations no matter if your interest scores are generally very high, no matter if your profile is flat and generally low scores, everybody will get top occupations flagged with stars. So that is a brief summary to what we have here in this occupation section. I will go ahead and click this link so that you can see what happens in the appendix. You have your top 20 occupations repeated. And you can see as we scroll down, the number of stars in this top column tends to decrease. So the entire set of occupations is available in the, in the basic career satisfaction report. Okay. Following the occupations, we have the section on academic majors. And you'll note that this setup is nearly identical to what we have for the occupations. So we have uh, a description of the majors, we have the theme codes that are associated with each major, we have a satisfaction score indicating the probability that this respondent would be either satisfied or very satisfied in this major, and we have a similarity score that again is directly analogous to the current occupation scales or the occupation similarity scores. We combine these scores again to make top recommendations 
Notice there are fewer, uh, uh, excuse me, to make uh, recommendations around the top majors. Notice there are fewer uh, majors that have top stars associated with them. That's just because there are only 33 majors. So there are going to be fewer of them flagged here. There are no links for the majors on the career satisfaction report because we haven't found a single source like ONET is for an occupation that provides a lot of great background um, on these academic majors. So hopefully um, people will be able to use these directly. You know, a lot of these are pretty straightforward kinds of um, common descriptions uh, of academic majors. Our, our major system that we're using is the IPEDS system of classification. Um, so it's a very widely used um, uh, major classification system, um, but that is one of the differences between the major section and um, the occupation section. It is possible in the future that if we can find a good source, um, we will add links to this report, but uh, we cannot uh, promise that at this point in time. So those are the major results. Following those, we have a couple of pages that are probably only of interest to practitioners that you probably wouldn't review with the client directly, but we have a report summary page that repeats some of the basic information from the GOT, EIS, and personal style scale sections, some of the highest scores um, across those, um, those sections of scales. And then we have a response summary page where you can look at things like the distribution of item responses across the entire inventory, a statement about um, inattentive responding or the possibility of inattentive responding with the consistency index and the number of items omitted. We've also added something called occupation reassec percentages, which is um, similar to something that we have taught people to do for years in the uh, certification program, looking at occupation scale reassec codes. So this is similar to that, uh, but you can read all about that in the strong technical supplement. Again, following that section is a complete list across, I think, seven pages of this respondent's full set of 243 occupations. All right, so that's a brief walkthrough of the career satisfaction report. So, as I start to wrap up here, let me just emphasize a few basic points again. The current strong assessment and the strong 244 assessment both exist today. Both are quality assessments. You can use both with confidence today and in the coming years and know that you are still using great tools with your clients. So both are still good assessments. Both are going to be available and practitioners can choose which assessment and which report they think is gonna be most useful for them. If you're trying to figure out which one you'd like to go with, um, a little bit of guidance. Um, I would suggest if you are on the fence that the strong 244 in the career satisfaction report is probably where you would want to go. Uh, the reasons for that are uh, some of the features that we've talked about, right? The, the new assessment has more scores, more occupations, a new set of results around academic majors, and is just more modern and up-to-date, right? The world of work changes over time, and this is the latest strong assessment, so this is going to be the one that's most up-to-date. Uh, in addition, it's gender neutral, which is appealing to a lot of people. And although the current strong is not going to go away, uh, those reports are going to be available. I'm sure we'll be answering questions and perhaps preparing technical briefs and so on in the future. Um, I would expect that the vast majority of our future developmental efforts are going to focus around the strong 244 assessment. So um, the future is a little bit brighter in the sense of uh, you know, things to come on the strong 244. That said, uh, the career satisfaction report is the only report that we have currently available with the strong 244 assessment. So if you are used to using, say, the strong interpretive report or the college profile or some of the other strong reports that we have available, and you really like those reports, 
um, you may want to stick with the current strong assessment, right? That is certainly a valid and understandable reason for why people may want to continue to use the currently available strong assessment. It's just a wider variety of report outputs that are available. And then, of course, there's just the general issue of familiarity, right? If you don't particularly want to learn much about the satisfaction scores or the academic major scores, um, then you know sticking with the, the current strong assessment um, is is something that you can do, and it is certainly a valid choice. Uh, but in general, I would say that if you're on the fence, I would lean towards going with the strong 244 assessment and the career satisfaction report. If you want to learn more about the Strong 244, obviously you've heard a lot from me today, uh, but there is a product page that we have around the 244 assessment. Um, Caitlin is going to be sending out a link to that page uh, soon if you don't have it already. Uh, but another way to find the product page is to go to our homepage at myersbreaks.com and search for Career Satisfaction Report. Uh, if you do that, you will end up at this page here that runs through a lot of the features and also has links to frequently asked questions, has link uh, to the technical supplement, a link to the sample report, and of course, a link to purchase. So um, if you're looking for a basic resource to kind of get started and, and find that other information uh, that we reviewed today, this page is a nice way to do it. The search bar on our homepage is located up here on the top ribbon. And that is the end of my planned presentation. So we have a few minutes left and available for Q&A. Um, Caitlin, if you have um, any questions, I'd be happy to listen. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of questions, actually. Um, so I'm going to do my best to read through them, um, but forgive me if I <laughs> say something that's not totally correct. Um, so we had a couple of different people ask, if gender isn't being used, why are we still asking for it? Ah, great question. Yeah, so we have a standard demographic survey that we ask of respondents who use any assessment on our system. So this is if they're completing the MBTI, if they're completing Fiber B or the California Psychological Inventory. Um, everybody uh, gets a standard demographic questionnaire and that questionnaire is really just intended to help us validate um, our assessments and learn about how it's operating for different groups of people. So uh, those questions also are um, important for us for being able to build the kinds of models that we have on the strong because we ask people for things like, what's your job title, right? That's how we, that's how we gather data from people in these occupations is we get their job titles, uh, we ask them their satisfaction levels, right? We ask them um, uh, ethnic background, right? We wanna make sure that our assessment is working well for um, people of different ethnicities. Um, so all those kinds of questions are really just aimed at helping us drive um, research and making that our assessments are working the way that we hope they're working uh, for groups of people and to drive the development of future scores. Um, so those, those questions are optional, right? You don't have to respond to those questions. Respondents don't have to provide us an answer and they're not used in the scoring um, of the assessments themselves. Uh, they're really just intended to drive future research and development. Okay, great. Um, another one that we got a couple of different times and a couple different phrasings of it is, um, what is the highest satisfaction score or is it is the satisfaction score out of 100? Um, talking a little bit about the scale of that. Yeah, so the highest possible satisfaction score is a, is a 99. Um, I don't know if I've actually seen that, um, but in theory, that would be the highest possible. Uh, again, just to repeat, the satisfaction score indicates a probability that the respondent, based on their interests, will be either satisfied 
or very satisfied in that occupation. So it, um, the highest we can get on that particular score is 99. The lowest would be a 1. Okay, um, and then there was another one on satisfaction scores. So um, I anticipate respondents asking why there's a satisfaction level and similarity category. How would you suggest explaining the difference? Yeah, so um, similarity scores are something that a lot of practitioners are probably familiar with if you've used the strong, right? So we've had them on the strong really since the beginning of the assessment. And so similarity scores should be, um, you know, interpreted in much the same way as, um, as they have in the past, right? What we found is that in developing these satisfaction scores is that satisfaction scores are generally positively correlated with similarity, but not that highly. So across the entire set of occupations currently, I think it's in the low point twos, the average correlation that we get between similarity and satisfaction across that entire set of occupations. So in general, you should expect to find that as similarity scores increase, satisfaction scores also increase. But what I think satisfaction helps uh, bring to light a little bit more is that you know, we're basing these satisfaction models, these probabilities on people that are in these occupations. And if you start looking at the satisfaction data in detail, you'll find that there are pretty big differences across occupations in terms of the average level of satisfaction. So for instance, CEOs, I'm guessing most people would not be surprised to find that CEOs are generally more satisfied with their occupations than telemarketers. And what we have is a situation where, you know, we have these satisfaction scores that take into account not only that baseline level of satisfaction within an occupation, but also the factors that, that seem to be correlated with, with satisfaction within that occupation. So we take the respondents' interests, we run them through these models, and we give them a satisfaction score that kind of gives them an indication of, you know, these are occupations that, that fit your interests and that, that, um, that not only that, but have a higher baseline level of satisfaction. So the result of that is that by taking both scores into account, we can kind of drive people towards occupations where they are mo more similar and where their satisfaction levels are likely to be higher. And so that across large numbers of people, what ends up happening is that you end up moving occupations with generally higher satisfaction levels up the, up the list. Um, so, you know, that, that may be a longer explanation than you were hoping for, but, um, you know, part of it is we want to hear from people as this is released and reaches a wider audience, you know, how it is that they're used and uh, how people do find it useful. You know, this is a new set of scores for the strong, and so, um, you know, we're urging people to be a little more cautious with them than they would be with, say, the similarity scores. Uh, but we think they definitely offer some valuable information for people. Great. Um, okay, so another one that we got in a couple of different ways um, is about, uh, where did it go? So is there any plan or time frame for updating or creating a combined MBTI Strong 244 report or career report? Uh, we have talked about that internally and kicked around some ideas, uh, but I am not um, able to discuss any detailed plans about that, unfortunately. So no, there's nothing that I can really share. I know that that's something we have talked about doing. I will just mention, though, that one of the nice things about some of these new scores that we have on the Strong 244 and the Career Satisfaction Report is that we have similar, uh, sorry, we have satisfaction scores um, that we have calculated already based on MBTI results uh, for a number of occupations. Those of you who have seen our MBTI careers offering, uh, we have kind of a parallel setup uh, for some of those scores. 
And uh, so there, there is a, we, we've tried to set things up in a way so that if we can create a combined product, we will have kind of a parallel set of scores across those assessments. Um, so we, we've thought about it, we've kicked around some ideas, but um, I can't talk about any concrete plans that we have at this time. Okay, um, so there was another question about um, whether or not the similar updates would be rolled out through Vina Navis. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be a similar answer as well? Uh, yeah, I can't talk too much about concrete um, plans, but um, we do have the Strong 244 and the Career Satisfaction Report on Vita Navis. Um, those of you who are not familiar, Vita Navis is, um, is a separate website that we, uh, that we maintain, a separate system. Um, so our, our report is, the Career Satisfaction Report is currently on Vita Navis and um, future changes to this report and to the occupation list and so on will also be on Vita Navis. Yeah. Great. Um, another question, we have a lot of questions. Um, so another question is, should practitioners get recertified for strong 244 usage? Uh, that's not required. Um, we are uh, making some modifications to the certification program going forward to um, to train people in this in this assessment. You know, obviously a lot of it's going to stay the same. A lot of the content's going to stay the same. Um, but we are making some modifications to the certification program going forward. People are not required to get recertified to use the Strong 244. Um, and through things like the technical supplement, and we are going to be um, producing some additional materials to help people get more familiar with the assessment. Um, I would think that most people would probably be fine making use of those resources, uh, but of course, it's always um, you know possible to go get uh, recertified if if you like. Um, I do think, though, that you would find the vast majority of the content has not changed very much um, if you're already certified. Okay. Um, so another question that we have is um, a little bit more about your specific approach to this, Mike. So what might you say to a person who has a high similarity score but low satisfaction score? I would say if it's uh, certainly if it's among their top recommended occupations, right? If it's one of the first um, few listed or has three stars associated with it, I would use that as a jumping point to explore that occupation more. You know, my general recommendation is for people to explore really widely. And if you have the time, I would suggest to people that they look through links of every occupation that they have one to three stars in the top column which is a lot for most people, dozens and dozens. So my general recommendation is for people to um, explore widely. And you know those scores don't have to be taken, um, you know, they, they're, they're not, you don't look at those scores and say, that's the truth. That's, that's uh, you know, represents everything that we know about these occupations, and I should just believe the number on the page, and that should be my guiding force going forward. Um, you know, one of the things that we say in the certification program is that the strong helps us ask better questions uh, of our clients, right, about what they're interested in, what they would find fulfilling, what they want to do. And so if you have an occupation that's towards the top of the list, I would say go ahead and explore it, read about it see what you think. But the satisfaction score, uh, a lower satisfaction score would indicate that either one or both of these things, either that uh, the occupation itself tends to um, have lower satisfaction levels overall, like say the telemarketer role, um, or that this respondent's particular pattern of interest tends to be associated with lower satisfaction levels amongst people who are actually in those positions. Um, so like I said, in general, you'll find higher satisfaction scores with higher similarity scores. So that pattern shouldn't occur that often, um, but that would, that would be the explanation. Um, and if it's, if it's towards the top of the list, I would, I would encourage somebody to go ahead and explore that occupation to see um, if, they're, if they're interested further. 
Great. Okay, last question that we'll have time for. Um, and then I know there's so many other questions that have been submitted, so we will follow up via email. Um, but for this last question, is there a list of which occupations have been added or updated on the website that you mentioned? Uh, there is no side-by-side -side list um, in terms of like the current set of 130 and the 243. That are available now. Uh, there is not a side-by-side -side list, but that's that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Um, so I will note that down as something that I might want to to add. Okay, great, perfect. Well, that I think wraps it up for us for today. Like I said, um, I know there's a bunch of questions that are still coming in, so we will follow up with you all on those via email, um, and we will send out an email with a copy of this recording and the slides, as well as those links that Mike shared. So um, if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to email us or respond to that email so um, we can make sure that we, we get to all of them. But that wraps it up for us for today. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Mike, for presenting. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time today. All right, have a great day, everyone.